Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Steben, and I'm the uh, president of uh, IUSCI uh, Canada. I'm very happy to uh, chair this session of uh, our webinar series, and it's about HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. A PrEP is effective but underused, a call to action. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker today, Dr. Daryl Tan, who's uh, the research director and clinical scientist uh, at uh, uh, St. Michael's Hospital. He leads the options uh, collaboratory in HIV STI treatment and prevention science, also associate professor in the Department of Medicine and Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. His research focuses on clinical trials and implementation science in the area of HIV prevention and treatment, STI, and COVID-19. Dr. Tan holds a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in HIV Prevention and STI, and also is the co-lead of the HIV Prevention Core of the CIHR Canadian HIV Trials Network, and a member of the Governing Council of the International AIDS Society. So please, Dr. Tan. I'll take it away. Thank you so much, Mark, for that uh, introduction. And thanks so much to you and to uh, CPHA for the kind invitation to speak today. Uh, I've just uh, shared in the chat a link to our website. If anyone is curious about what else we're up to, uh, today I'm going to talk about PrEP, as you heard. And I've you know, intentionally chosen an, a title for the talk that I we hoped would be somewhat inspirational and, and motivating, uh, although um, certainly a lot of the content is going to just cover some of the core basics of, of, of prep prescribing today in Canada. So before we go any further, I did want to pause and recognize the traditional territory that we're meeting on, which is and always will be Indigenous land. Uh, I'm located in Tekaranto, which is the traditional territory specifically of the um, Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Chippewa, and Huron-Wendat people. Um, I hope our participants today are from many different places um, in this land, and I, I encourage you to reflect on the traditional territories that you're uh, currently on, that you, that you live and work on, um, and what that implies for the work that we do every day, especially when it comes to a field like HIV prevention. I think we all know just how important it is that we be attentive to Indigenous concerns and the ongoing legacy of uh, colonialism and racism. We hear devastating news stories like that one out of Winnipeg just this morning that I'm sure you uh, all heard about. Um, and it's a constant reminder of how, how real these needs are and how important uh, and salient uh, this acknowledgement is uh, for our daily work. Uh, in healthcare, but also as, as citizens of this country, or, or not necessarily citizens, sorry, people uh, living in this country, I should say. Uh, here are some disclosures that, that I want to um, mention. I have received research grants, or at least my institution has, for investigator-initiated studies from a few entities, including um, Gilead, Merck, um, Abvi, uh, Viv, uh, on the site PI for some clinical trials that are sponsored, sponsored by uh, GSK. Um, and as mentioned, they received some salary support from the Canada Research Chairs Program. The learning objectives that we had put together, um, uh, Mark and myself and CPHA, um, were these. So we'll first speak about the effectiveness evidence for PrEP in general. Secondly, we'll compare PrEP regimen. And third, we'll spend a few minutes uh, um, hoping to uh, help you all gain some more comfort in prescribing or providing PrEP to those who can benefit from it. Now, before we dive into those objectives, though, uh, we wanted to have a little bit of interactivity uh, and uh, ask you all uh, what your professional background uh, or training is. Uh, pick one of these options, if you don't mind, um, and we'll take about 20, 30 seconds for you all to click. It's helpful for us to know who is joining us and the perspectives that you all bring. So let's give it about 10 more seconds. Okay, hopefully you've all had a chance to reach for that mouse and click one of these. Um, so if we could move on and see the results, fantastic, thank you. So we've got a smattering of different uh, professional backgrounds represented, it looks like. Uh, nursing, you win, as always. 
Um, and then we've also got some uh, folks from Epi with pharmacy and physician backgrounds, health promotion, uh, lab backgrounds. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you very much for participating uh, in that poll. It's very helpful for, for us. Um, all right. We're going to move back to the um, learning objectives and start with this first one about just reviewing some of the effectiveness evidence for PrEP overall. And I think some of the most telling effectiveness evidence that we've now um, seen globally is a data that's emerged from jurisdictions that have done a pretty good job of rolling it out. And we started to see real population level or ecological um, evidence that PrEP really does work and doing what it's supposed to do at the population level, which is to decrease new HIV infections. These are data that, as you can see, are already several years old, but I think it's striking that um, it was already demonstrating a signal in England specifically so soon after PrEP rollout really began in earnest uh, in that part of the United Kingdom, which was in the early um, part of the last decade. And notably, this was even in the context of much more kind of organic rollout of PrEP as opposed to, you know, systems level public health programmatic rollout of PrEP, which has, I think, also been scaled up in that jurisdiction. But you can see that in this key population of gay and bisexual men, uh, the uh, estimate of HIV incidence really meaningfully started to decline uh, and uh, coincided with the rollout of PrEP, together with other interventions as well, of course, such as treatment as prevention. But when we look at other jurisdictions, we start to really see this pattern. So here are some data from New South Wales and Sydney, again published uh, from 2018, but this group has gone on to publish further data a few years later in 2021, demonstrating that the same trends held up. What you're seeing is before and after the introduction of a very large uh, public health-led rollout of pre-exposure prophylaxis specifically to gay, bisexual, and other men with sex with men, uh, across that state of Australia. And you can see that across multiple age strata, across many uh, different um, groups of uh, GBM, uh, according to place of birth and area of residence, you can see dramatic declines in um, actual new HIV infections in that population. Um, and it was really concentrated in the groups that the efforts were focused on. And that's why you see such a dramatic signal of virtually a halving of HIV incidents, specifically in the gay uh, neighborhoods of, uh, of Sydney, Australia's most populous city. So this, I hope, can inspire us. This and examples from other settings in the world that I'm not taking the time to show today about what we could, and I would argue even should be able to achieve and should be achieving in this country. Uh, here's what our own estimated HIV infection rate looks like in Canada. That's the solid line. You can see the blue shading showing you a plausible range. And uh, this is the most updated data that we have from the Public Health Agency of Canada. I think it's fair to say that we've had a modest decline, it appears, uh, over the last couple of decades. Whether we're really seeing a sustained uh, drop and a clear inflection point uh, relative to how we've been doing before PrEP was introduced, uh, I think is more debatable. And certainly I think it's fair to say that we've actually had the tools at our disposal to be basically ending uh, new HIV infections, uh, but we're not clearly uh, realizing that true potential. Um, and uh, here are some pie charts showing you a fairly static picture in terms of the key populations that are affected by new HIV infections in Canada, as well as prevalent infections, of course. GBM, or here abbreviated gay by and other men of sex with men, the GBMSM, have consistently represented the largest uh, group of individuals um, uh, um, in, in whom new infections occur, uh, including uh, some overlap with people who inject drugs. Uh, but then you see that people who inject drugs in other heterosexual populations, particularly uh, indigenous folks, uh, other folks who are racialized or from other uh, endemic countries, also uh, bear a disproportionate burden. So this is, uh, I think, a clue as to where we really need to be uh, focusing our efforts in terms of HIV uh, prevention efforts. Uh, and of course, PrEP is uh, key among them. So now let's turn from some of the population level data to some of the clinical trial data that uh, gives us the efficacy data on which we hope to achieve greater uh, population level effectiveness with this intervention. So this is a table summarizing some of the core clinical trials that showed us uh, a long time ago now, that daily oral pre-exposure prophylaxis works. 
at preventing HIV infections in many different populations in many different settings around the world. So you see data here in different studies. I'm not going to uh, read through them, uh, but you can see that it represents, uh, again, uh, men of sex with men or, or GBM more broadly, heterosexual uh, men and women, people who inject drugs. You can see that most of these trials used the intervention that we're effectively going to concentrate our, our, our comments on when we speak about this first uh, version of PrEP, which is daily oral tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate with emtricitabine, that's the TDF-FTC, co-formulated in a single pill, uh, originally marketed under the trade name Truvada, but now also available for uh, many years in Canada in multiple generic forms. And you can see that the number of HIV infections was dramatically lower in the PrEP groups in these trials compared to the control groups. Uh, all of these participants in clinical trials, of course, received a full package of standard of care of other prevention interventions, testing, condoms, behavioral counseling, STI management, but we still saw these meaningful reductions in HIV infection rates, as you can see summarized on the right-hand column over here. Now, some folks will look at these numbers and feel like, well, sure, they're statistically significant and they're somewhat clinically significant, but they may not sound or feel that impressive if this is maybe the first time you're looking at these data. Um, I want to uh, emphasize, though, uh, that one of the key things that we've learned through our experience with PrEP is that uh, one of the key determinants, of course, is adherence to the actual medication. And this is a, letter, uh, a lesson that we learned early on after these trials were done. Notably, I want to point out that these data have been around for over a decade. I've circled that the first trial, uh, IPREX, was actually published in 2010, over uh, 12 years ago now. But as I was mentioning, the key determinant of PrEP efficacy is really adherence to the intervention. And we look across all the different PrEP trials uh, that have uh, had been done as of a few years ago, which are summarized on this uh, colorful graphic here, you can see this very clear linear relationship between greater adherence, in this case represented by the proportion of participant samples that had detectable drug levels, and the outcome on the y-axis here, which is effectiveness of the intervention, uh, namely percent reduction in new HIV infections. And so that helps us to contextualize those numbers that may not have seemed that impressive. We know that the motivation to adhere with a study drug in a clinical trial, when you as a participant might be told, you know, there's a 50% chance that you're going to get a placebo right now. Uh, we're uh, also telling those study participants at that time, we do not know whether this intervention even works. Please help us find out. The motivation to take that study drug is not at all the same as it may be today when we try to have that same conversation with a potential user in the clinical setting in 2023. Now we can tell folk, you know, if you take this medication, we know with confidence that it can decrease your risk of acquiring HIV tremendously. We'll talk about exactly how much um, in uh, a little while, but suffice it to say that certainly in folks who take it consistently, we believe we can achieve reductions in HIV uh, risk of virtually 100%. And there's not that much out there uh, in the preventive uh, realm uh, across medicine that can really rival that degree of effort. So you would think that with that degree of evidence uh, and, and uh, those uh, efficacy findings, that we, we would be you know, rolling this out uh, very aggressively. And I think that if we had rewound uh, re back to the bad old days of the HIV epidemic in the certainly the late 1980s, the early 1990s, if we told people back then, hey, there's an intervention that's safe and uh, efficacious to prevent your risk of acquiring HIV by almost 100%, I think we would be doing really, really well uh, with rollout and perhaps with the epidemic overall. Here's what our data show us in terms of PrEP uptake. Now, again, these data are a little um, uh, out of date already because there's some lag in the availability of the data. But on the left, you see a paper that my team did a few years ago uh, looking at trends in PrEP uptake in the province of Ontario using pharmacy refill data. And we tried to estimate what uptake looked like in both uh, people uh, who are labeled as male. I, I, we're unable to distinguish trans identities here, so just male and female. That's the blue, uh, sorry, that's the gray line, which is almost superimposable on the blue line, which is the overall uh, rate. You can see that there's hardly any female uptake, which is a problem in itself. Uh, and there are a few inflection points where we do see, see statistically significant increases in the uptake, but it's certainly not really jumping out at you as an exponential increase. Um, and this goes up to the early half of 2018. 
Uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada did a similar exercise looking at eight Canadian provinces. You can see similar uh, trends in terms of male, female. Again, we don't know about cis and uh, transgender status, uh, but um, uh, we can see an increase certainly, which is encouraging, uh, but uh, perhaps we could be doing even better than this, especially with such a tremendously efficacious intervention. So I hope that gives you a little bit of background in terms of how efficacious and how actually population level effectiveness could be with PrEP. With that in mind, let's focus now a little bit more on what we know about the specific PrEP regimens that are available for use in Canada. So there are a number of options that are on the table already. Those are shown on the left-hand side of this schematic from uh, clinical care options. Uh, you can see that they comprise oral tablets, and uh, we've uh, listed both TFFTC, which is the drug that was studied in those clinical trials I briefly outlined for you a moment ago, as well as another drug that we'll talk about briefly in a moment, tenofovir allophenamide, or TAF, together with FTC. But there are also emerging technologies that are available in different parts of the world, not yet in Canada, uh, that are really exciting to talk about. So one of them is the intravaginal ring. Uh, this is a product that has been demonstrated to have efficacy in clinical trials when the ring is loaded with a drug, depivirine, uh, as well as a long-acting injectable agent. And thus far, we only have uh, data for a long-acting injectable antiretroviral called cabotegravir. We'll speak a little bit more about that in just a few moments. What you can see that's exciting about these options, as well as some of the ones on the right-hand side, such as a an implant under the surface of the skin, for example, or an antibody infusion, is that these are all long-acting options. And as such, they have tremendous potential and actual advantages over oral tablets in terms of folks' ability to adhere with them and therefore to enjoy those uh, prevention uh, efficacy benefits uh, without relying on regular pill-taking behavior, which can, of course, be challenging for folks. So this is where we... Um, uh, hope to be in a few years with uh, more of these options available in Canada. Why is that important? I think we've learned this from many other fields of medicine, and I wanted to pause and just highlight that for a couple of moments with a couple of data slides. The example of contraception is an example that I think is such a beautiful illustration for lessons learned uh, and applicable that, and that are applicable to the rollout of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, not only is it kind of uh, loaded with so many of the uh, risks of moralistic um, reasoning that, that some out there may, may impose upon the intervention uh, because of its link with trying to prevent an outcome that is uh, uh, associated with, with sex, which is a stigmatized uh, topic in general in, in societies worldwide. Uh, but we've really seen uh, really meaningful epidemiologic data about the uh, rollout of, of contraception that are directly applicable to, to PrEP and that we would be wise to learn from. So here's one example of that sort of lesson. This is a study that was done a, a, a number of years ago uh, in which uh, individual countries uh, are each represented by a data point on this graph. And uh, at, a, at a moment in time, what was done was uh, each country was uh, um, assigned uh, a, a number on the x-axis here, which represents the number of contraception options that were available in the population at that time. And then the y-axis, which is here abbreviated MCPR, I can't remember exactly what the acronym stands for, but effectively it's a, it's a measure of the proportion uh, of the amount of uptake of contraception, the level of population level coverage of any of, of some form of contraception uh, in the eligible population. And you see this beautiful linear relationship. And it just makes the point that when you offer more choice, more options to a population, uh, regardless of the minor differences that may exist between some of the characteristics of those options, the fact that there are more options available uh, is associated with more uptake. And that only makes sense when we think about human behavior uh, and we recognize that there's tremendous diversity in populations that we want to uh, celebrate and, and respect. Closer to home, we have tried to study this in different ways uh, in our population of GBM here in Toronto. This is a paper that we um, uh, did summarizing a bit of a thought experiment that we asked participants to undertake with us. We told them in this study about different existing and different hypothetical options for PrEP, some of which we'll speak about in just a moment. And then we asked them a number of questions 
uh, using a design called the discrete choice experiment to see, you know, what what would you uh, what would you use if if different prep options had these different characteristics? And using those data, we're able to estimate uh, not only uh, the degree of value that people place on different characteristics of those prep options, but we're actually able to predict the degree of uptake that we might achieve in that population, uh, as shown here, uh, if those options were available. So at the time that we did this survey, and it remains true uh, today in 2023, the only PrEP options that we can offer folks uh, are a daily pill or an on-demand pill. Uh, and I'll have you note just in this first set of rows that we predict actually that if folks really knew about these options, that we predict that actually most of these GBM would actually choose the on-demand PrEP as opposed to the daily version of PrEP. But notably, we have a considerable number of people, a proportion of people, 16%, who say, you know, no, thank you, even when we make these options available. But what I've highlighted in red is that if we add on additional hypothetical options that we hope one day will become actual available options, not just hypothetical ones, we can see that that number goes down. It goes down from 16% to 12 point something percent, a little further down when we make uh, not only a monthly injection available, but a rectal gel uh, hypothetically available. And you may say, well, that's great. It's going down, but not that much. And I think what we need to remember is, uh, in addition to the absolute proportion of people who don't have any PrEP coverage going down being a goal, uh, the other goal is that we uh, reach the right folks. And so if that tiny 0.2% of hypothetical people that would agree to take this next PrEP option that becomes available happen to be the folks who are uh, experiencing the greatest risk, I think that really means a lot in terms of what we could achieve at a population level. We weren't able to explore that with these data, uh, but I hope that it conveys to you the fact that more options, uh, more choice is a good thing. It can translate into more uptake at a population level, uh, and that in itself is a really worthy goal. So let's talk a little bit about the op options that we do have available uh, before we talk about those hypothetical ones in more detail. In addition to oral uh, uh, TDF-FTC taken daily, uh, we also have oral TDF-FTC taken using what's called this on-demand sort of regimen. And this was studied in a pivotal clinical trial called Ikerge that was led by our colleagues in France, together with some uh, amazing contribution from our own country. Uh, sites in Montreal participated in this trial. And as you may know, what this looked at is a regimen of taking your PrEP just around the time of uh, potential exposure. Uh, so uh, what's uh, demonstrated is these cute smiling uh, faces is, of course, a sex act where there would be a meaningful uh, risk of exposure, such as condomless anal sex. The recommendation, according to this regimen, is what we call to take your PrEP in a 2 one, one fashion. What that means is taking two pills, a double dose, two to 24 hours before sex, to clear that that could be the very same day, and take another tablet the next day, 24 hours later, and then another pill uh, a day after that. And then you stop there. And then this sex act is now covered by PrEP. And if this person isn't having sex for uh, some period of time after that, then they don't have to take pills uh, all of that other time. This fits intuitively with many people's understanding of you know, when they're at risk and when they're not at risk, uh, and is very popular for some people for that reason. Now, this trial, interestingly, was actually halted early on the recommendation of the DSMC because of clear evidence that it had efficacy. So you can see that very clearly in this kaplan Meyer curve. Now, the numbers are small, but you can see a, a dramatic difference statistically uh, in the uh, two arms. Notably, uh, although there were two infections that occurred in the active arm of this trial, it was very clear from interviewing those study participants that they were really not taking the intervention uh, at the time uh, that they acquired HIV. So the intent to treat analysis associates them, uh, those infections with the intervention, but truly they were not taking it. So once again, illustrating the importance of adherence. So 211 truly is a strategy that um, has efficacy. Now, I think in practical terms, in much of the world, um, and certainly much of the world outside of the jurisdictions where these this trial was initially done, it hasn't had as much traction as the daily option uh, in, uh, in GBM. And the, the reason for that is probably just familiarity with the protocol, as well as the fact that there wasn't the same volume of data. There was really just this one clinical trial looking at 211 prep in GBM. Uh, there's a host of trials and cohort studies that have been done 
of a daily oral TDFFT in, in many populations globally. And so people were used to that uh, approach. But fortunately, in the last couple of years, there have been more data coming out. Uh, here is an example of two cohort studies in which folks were offered this off-labeled use of PrEP. Um, this is, again, of course, only uh, gay by and other men who have sex with men, because that's the only context in which it's been studied in a clinical trial. And in the study in China, in, in Paris, in France, what you can see was that at enrollment in these studies, folks were explicitly offered the choice of these two possibilities. Uh, I have the data here on the right for the Paris cohort in which roughly half and half uh, chose the two interventions. And what was striking was that the incidence was uh, comparable between the two arms. We don't see a difference in what we should call effectiveness of these two interventions. Uh, and I think uh, um, closer to home here in Canada, myself, many other practitioners have certainly uh, had much, much more clinical experience now with uh, more time going by with this regimen largely driven, I would say, by the COVID pandemic. During that period, there was lockdown on, lockdown off, different jurisdictions, uh, you know, different um, behaviors that, of course, people were uh, engaging in in terms of their, their patterns of sexual contact that were different from their usual. Having options that people could kind of use more flexibly when they needed them and not use it when they didn't need it was very handy. Um, many people that I spoke to and colleagues have spoken to during that time, you know, truly had no knowledge of the 211 um, uh, regimen. Uh, and I think that that's that tells us a lot about the job, the better job that we need to do in terms of letting people know what their options are. Uh, here are some empirical data uh, showing that when you make both options available, people do choose uh, both of them. Our hypothetical data showed us uh, a, a couple of slides ago that we would anticipate many GBM, if not most, to actively prefer the on demand option. There initially were also some concerns that the clinical trial of 211 PrEP had been done in a population that was having a lot of exposure. They were using the 211 uh, roughly four times in a month. Roughly, that means sex, let's say, on average once a week. Uh, there was relatively less experience, therefore, with using it in folks who had you know, less frequent sexual exposures. And maybe some of the discomfort was around that. Once again, in uh, with more time going by, with these larger studies demonstrating that it's uh, not been associated with an, an excessive degree of failure um, in, in real world settings where you have lots of diversity of sexual exposure risk, uh, I think this uh, tells us that we should be using this with more confidence and certainly letting our patients know that it's available. Now, as I alluded to in that earlier schematic, looking at different oral uh, and then uh, future and hypothetical PrEP options a moment ago, we also have another oral version of PrEP that we can use specifically in gay, bi, and other men of sex with men. And I like to call this a version 2.0 of that initial drug. So it's not for your doxypoxyl fumarate with amtricetamine. TBF FTC is the drug that many of us have been familiar with many years. TAF FTC came along uh, after that and has some advantages we'll talk about in a moment. But it was compared head to head in this large clinical trial of over 5,000 gay, bi, and other men obsessed with men called the DISCOVER trial, published in The Lancet in 2020. Um, and what that trial demonstrated was that the daily oral use of TAF FTC is non inferior to daily oral TDF FTC uh, for HIV prevention. You can see that illustrated in the graphic uh, both on the left. Uh, and then you can see uh, on the right what the uh, measured uh, HIV incidence in that population was, clearly demonstrating non-inferiority of this new regimen. So that's great, but it's still a daily oral pill. Why would we bother to use another option? Why are we interested in a version 2.0? And the answer is that because uh, is because TAF does not have some of the key um, potential toxicities that TDF can have, which are really uh, bone-related and kidney-related side effects of uh, it's not fear, the isoproxyl fumarate. So that's often something that's measured on the bone front using bone mineral densitometry. And we know that when folks start TDF-containing regimens, certainly as PrEP, also when they use that drug for the treatment of HIV, using the treatment of hepatitis B, we know that bone density goes down uh, during that first year, especially of taking the drug regularly. 
what we saw in the Discover trial was a marked difference when folks took the TAP FTC instead. We did not see the decline that we see with TDF FTC. And that mirrors our experience using TAP FTC in, or TAP, I should say, in HIV treatment as well, as well as hepatitis B. On the kidney front, we know that long term use of TDF can also be associated with some renal dis, um, uh, dysfunction. So we do see uh, serum creatinine levels creep up and therefore creatinine clearance uh, de decline at a slight, slightly steeper rate. When people are on TDF FTC or when people are on TDF um, in general, I should say, compared to not taking that drug. And then that effect is really not um, not marked uh, or not as uh, not as apparent when people use TAF instead. So you can see a statistically significant difference between the two arms in terms of their uh, serum creatinine levels, as well as their calculated creatinine clearance levels, uh, favoring the use of TAF. So those are really the advantages of that drug. That's why uh, these studies were pursued. So which regimen to choose? I think. Uh, there are some clear advantages that we've just spoken about with TAF FTC, renal and bone being the main thing. But there are some reasons that we would still favor the TDF in some circumstances. So far, we do not have 211 data supporting the use of TAF uh, FTC in that setting. So if someone is interested in the 211 option or is interested in the flexibility to toggle between daily and 211, then TDF would be the way to go. There's a dramatic cost difference at this point with TAF FTC uh, still being protected by patent uh, in, in Canada. So it's uh, marketed only as Descovi, which is a brand named product. So the cost is roughly four times greater. And then there are some other advantages to TDF FTC use that I haven't uh, shown you some data slides on today. Uh, but I'll just mention to you briefly that we do believe that there is a weight um, difference between the two drugs. Uh, at the one-year and two-year marks in that DISCOVER trial, the folks who had been taking uh, TDF FDC weighed about one and uh, a bit kilos less than those who were taking TAF FDC, so maybe a couple of pounds or so. Uh, and we think that that is more related to a weight suppressive effect of the TDF as opposed to the TAF causing weight increases. But of course, many people are very concerned about their weight and, and that might be an advantage uh, for some people to favor the TDF FTC. Part and parcel with that is also that TDF interestingly seems to have an actual lipid lowering impact uh, that does not exist with TAF FTC. So in someone who's got uh, a bit more of a metabolic syndrome on board or we are very conscious about their cholesterol levels, that there might be advantages to keeping them on TDF FTC instead. Now, at this point, we've really covered the PrEP options that exist and are available in Canada in um, 2023. I want to emphasize that the 211 use of TDF FTC uh, is an off label uh, use, um, uh, but that daily use of uh, either of these products is on label. Um, I also want to highlight that the daily TDF FTC is the only on-label use that's applicable for all populations um, interested in, in an HIV um, and PrEP intervention, whereas the 211 and the daily TAP FTC are really only applicable to GBM because that's where the clinical trial data exists at this time. But we're really, really hopeful that some of those long-acting options will come to Canada soon. And so I did I mention long-acting injectable prep uh, a few moments ago, and I want to end the section with a brief uh, mention of what we know about the efficacy of cabotegravir uh, as a long-acting uh, injection, so CAB-LA. The HPTN-083 trial was a large international clinical trial that compared eight weekly injectable CAB-LA to the standard of care for PrEP, which is daily oral TDF-FTC. It included uh, a non-trivial number of transgender women in the trial, which is a great achievement by the study team. And what was found remarkably was not only that cabotegravir LA was non-inferior to daily oral TDF FTC, but it was actually superior in terms of preventing HIV infection by 66%. 
Uh, an analogous trial was done showing effectively the same thing. This trial was importantly done in the population of cisgender women in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, uh, most of the, of the HIV risk in this population would have been through vaginal receptive sex, uh, as well as some anal receptive sex. Uh, and again, we see a very similar result. Not only was it non-inferior, which is how the trial was designed, but it was actually superior in terms of its prevention of HIV infection. This is a really remarkable finding because as we've said uh, a little earlier, oral PrEP is an intervention that if it's adhered to well, can achieve remarkably high degrees of HIV prevention efficacy. So how can you get better than something that is virtually you know, you know, so excellent or almost perfect uh, when taken properly? Of course, the answer is that folks have challenges taking it consistently. And so when you're comparing a daily active pill taking to just showing up for an injection once every two months, there are some clear advantages potentially for this latter option. Again, the clinical uh, trial data demonstrate uh, not only that it's safe and effective, but the preference data also suggests to us that there are folks out there who would preferentially choose this option. And I think it's a, a really exciting time for us to be thinking about how to position uh, this agent in our armamentarium uh, when it becomes available. I'll end this section by just uh, reminding us that there are other agents coming down the pipeline, pipeline as well. This uh, chart is already somewhat out of date. You can see that I had to unfortunately scratch off a really, really promising agent, which was long acting is Latravir, um, which is no longer being studied for PrEP, unfortunately, because it has been associated with um, uh, leukopenia as a toxicity, although it's being uh, continued for study in HIV therapy at a, at a low dose, which we think is, uh, which the manufacturer thinks is, is, is still safe to proceed with. But you can see other agents that are being looked at, not, not only as long-acting injections and as vaginal rings, but, but even as implants, as we were speaking about earlier. And we're really hopeful that having multiple modalities for PrEP will make uh, uptake that much more um, successful in the future. So that covers that second section. I'm going to wrap up this last section before the most fun part, which is uh, your, your comments and your questions, with uh, a few comments about just the nuts and bolts of, of rolling out PrEP to those who can benefit from it. And here is where I'm going to ask you to uh, reach for your, your mouse for a moment. And we're going to ask you this polling question, which I think is going to pop up on the screen. It reproduces what's on the PowerPoint screen. Um, I'll read through it with you. Do you I, I'm wondering whether those of you who either actually prescribe or uh, or maybe you can re replace, replace the word prescribe here with, you know, recommend or counsel. Um, do you have any of these apprehensions about, you know, delivering PrEP to someone who might benefit? Are you concerned about, A, the level of adherence that's required? We, we, we did talk about how important adherence is for it to work. Are you worried about side effects? Uh, are you worried that PrEP may ultimately lead to decreased condom use? Uh, are you worried about costs? or are none of these really a barrier for you at this point? So take um, 20 seconds or so to consider these. Uh, I think we're asking you for just one choice, so you can weigh them against each other. Let's say just five more seconds, five, four, three, two, one. And I look forward to seeing what people have to say. Interesting. Okay, there's this really nice kind of a fairly even distribution. Um, and notably, a third of you are, are really not concerned about these issues at all, which is uh, fabulous. That means that you're going to be rolling out prep uh, to, to, to all kinds of folks. Um, great. I, I put this question in here because I would say that for many years, certainly you know, since the beginning of prep's existence, these have been some of the most common uh, concerns. Um, I would even say at some point they were voiced as uh, framed as objections to PrEP. Um, but I thought I would um, just actively uh, talk about them for a moment. Uh, I put them all at the top of the slide here because we'll, we'll just show a slide or two about each of these topics um, to just give you a little bit more to think about uh, with those apprehensions. So in terms of um, adherence, uh, I've alluded to this already, but now I'm actually finally showing you the data slide that I've been hinting at for a while. This is a slide uh, that shows us the relationship between taking daily oral TDF FTC 
and the expected HIV incidence, specifically in the population of GBM. So this is based on those large early cohorts of folks um, uh, using daily oral PrEP. What they were able to do was measure people's drug levels, you know, that's represented by tenofovir diphosphate levels, so that's what this TFVDP is in femtomoles, per punch. And what the heck is a punch? A punch in this um, graphic represents a dried blood spot card where people um, collected their blood on, onto one of those dried blood spot cards and they would punch a circle, an evenly sized circle of that. And then uh, the lab was able to look at the intraerythrocytic levels of this active moiety of the drug and then correlate that, first of all, with number of pills that people said that they were taking per week. So early uh, data had, had shown these relationships between uh, taking it seven, six, five, four, three, two, one days per week. And then here is the, re the relationship with HIV incidence. So that's what allowed the investigators to show this whoops, beautiful relationship between um, uh, uh, there being virtually 100% risk reduction when folks took their supposedly daily oral prep, even as infrequently as only four days per week. That's forgetting your pill virtually every other day and still achieving a level of HIV prevention that people see that is virtually 100%. Now, there is a 95% confidence um, interval around that, of course, um, but it really gives an important message, which is that, in, at least in this population, PrEP is a lot more forgiving of imperfect adherence than certainly interviral therapy is, and potentially some other forms of PrEP, and potentially even the same form of PrEP, unfortunately, in other populations. We do not have these data uh, as robustly for vaginal exposures, for example. It does drop off, of course, if you're only taking your pill two or three days a week or less than that. Uh, but I, I show this to uh, emphasize the point that our obsession in the early days, especially around you know, withholding this intervention because we were worried about people's ability to adhere, is really actually um, canceled out by these data. Uh, and it encourages us to be using this uh, as uh, 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 much more widely. Uh, I would point out that there are virtually no other drugs I would think of where there's been a conversation about not prescribing it to people uh, who need it uh, because we're worried that they won't take it. Uh, we don't withhold you know, metformin for people with diabetes and antihypertensive drugs for people with hypertension just because we're worried that they, of course, as human beings, might not take their drug. The next concern is about side effects. And the good news about uh, TDF-FTC and by extension TAF-FTC uh, as borne out by the clinical trials is that the risk of adverse events is really minimal. Uh, in fact, here's a, a, a systematic review and meta-analysis that boldly said that it's effectively the same as placebo. Now, I will say that we do know that when people start on uh, daily oral uh, TAF or 211, um, uh, I should say uh, TDF-FTC or TAF-FTC or even 211, that there is a little bit of um, gastrointestinal upset that some people experience, but it is typically transient and virtually never causes someone to stop the drug. It can rarely happen. But overall, the safety profile is excellent. There are the issues with renal and bone uh, that we spoke about, but those are long-term issues. They're often outweighed by the importance of preventing HIV. Um, and in general, side effects, although it's a very common worry of people who uh, are not taking PrEP but are considering it, uh, the data tell us that it is much less of an issue than people may uh, uh, expect or, or, or uh, uh, anticipate. Part of the reason for that uh, benefit of TAF over TDF has to do with some of the pharmacokinetics of the drug. I won't speak through them in great detail, but one of the key things um, uh, of relevance as illustrated on this graphic is that when you take TDF, some of it gets metabolized into the active form already in the plasma compartment. And that can, of course, then get circulated through um, uh, the body to other end organs that could be impacted, such as the bones and the kidneys, whereas that's not the case with TAF. Uh, TAF, and even the smaller milligram dosage, uh, gets primarily transported right into the target cell where we want it to act against HIV once it's metabolized, with very little making it into the plasma. That's part of the reason for the better um, toxicity profile of that drug. Now, the condom use issue and the STI issue is one of the areas where some of the moralistic uh, concerns sometimes creep in. 
And I'm showing you some data from one of the studies that we did early on to look at sexual behavior uh, in a pretty crude way. This is just the number of partners that people uh, had, the number of condomless receptive and insertive anal sex acts that people uh, reported that they had had. Uh, after uh, uh, no time on PrEP, six months on PrEP, and then 12 months on, on PrEP, and you can see that there's an increase in that. And I put that out there just to make it clear that, yeah, this done, seems to happen to some extent, and it's not a surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise to us. Again, the lesson of contraception tells us the same thing. Of course, people are interested in interventions that can make something like sex uh, safe uh, or safer um, and not require condoms. That's a very understandable human impulse, and I think we shouldn't pass too much judgment on it. Um, the data are also similar that when we look at, if I flip through this, sorry, uh, when we look at um, STI incidents, um, certainly there have been lots of studies that have tried to look at the uh, incidence of bacterial STIs like gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, which we know are a huge concern at the population level. Um, and a look at the relationship with PrEP. And yeah, many of those studies have shown a relationship between these uh, things going up after the introduction of PrEP. But uh, once again, I think that's not too much of a surprise, unfortunately. PrEP doesn't prevent those other infections. Um, and, but we also know that people uh, are looking for alternatives to condoms. And these data show us from the United States that in fact, if we take the long view, the rates of those infections had been going up for many years uh, even well before PrEP existed, which is around here, 2010 was that first trial. This dotted line shows you really when PrEP implementation in the United States began in earnest a few years later. Now, this is not to say that we shouldn't be worried. Obviously, the public health um, practitioners and clinicians were very concerned about STI epidemics, but this is just to say that, yes, this is an understandable, perhaps unwanted side effect of uh, PrEP rollout, but uh, in, in my opinion and that of many others, uh, this is not something that we should use to argue that, you know, therefore we shouldn't use this highly safe and effective HIV prevention intervention. The last thing I'll comment on is cost. Um, and I'm impressed and, and pleased that only about a quarter of folks said that this was a concern for them uh, because uh, maybe that means that you're in a jurisdiction where cost uh, is not a barrier because of truly universal coverage. Uh, those are the uh, jurisdictions that I labeled here with the yellow star. True universal coverage to PrEP exists, um, uh, sometimes with some conditions, but for folks who can really benefit in these parts of Canada, uh, mostly out west, but you can see that in many parts of Canada, there is public coverage, but there is some degree of shared cost uh, that puts a burden of some sort on the potential user, and that really still does make it out of reach uh, or a huge burden for many people who are otherwise at risk of acquiring uh, a lifelong infection with HIV. So um, those are some of the key concerns. In terms of the mechanics of prescribing PrEP, I'm not going to talk about those in great detail. We do have guidelines that we published a few years ago that are published and freely available at CMAJ uh, that I recommend that folks consult. We're actively in the process with uh, an updated panel in updating this guideline, uh, although that work is going to continue for much of this calendar year. So uh, you can expect it sometime uh, in um, probably at the end of this year, early next year. Um, but I wanted to highlight that uh, those guidelines really capitalize on epidemiologic data that we've got here in Canada to help us figure out who uh, we should be uh, particularly interested in uh, recommending PrEP for. The data are most compelling in terms of granular risk factors for HIV in the population of GBM, who we identified as uh, representing the largest burden of infections uh, or a plurality of infections. You can see here that having other STIs is a common risk factor and these incidence rates per 100 person years, uh, even with a single infection like rectal gonorrhea or syphilis, are rivaling some of those that we see in some of the worst hit countries um, with, in terms of HIV incidence in adults in the world. Uh, we see similar rates in some of the adults um, data from uh, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. More recently, we had a review paper published led by one of our infectious diseases fellows, Amanda Hample, um, with some colleagues from uh, elsewhere in uh, Canada to talk about how we can better use this underused intervention. And uh, in that article, we included this schematic here which is even more in, intended to be even more kind of uh, broad in um, recommending that practitioners uh, at minimum discuss PrEP 
um, with folks who have any degree of risk at all. And you can see that that's folks who may have one or more partners um, where there's anything other than 100% you know, condom use or barrier precaution use. You know, this is really something that we should be recommending to, to that everyone at least know about uh, and certainly actively consider if they have demonstrable risk of exposure. Now, the guidelines do go through the nuts and bolts of how to um, evaluate and monitor someone on PrEP in terms of laboratory investigations. This is the table that really summarizes those recommendations, and it's not too complex. It involves a number of tests for safety-associated screening at baseline, as well as comprehensive STI screening uh, at baseline and uh, quarterly moving forward. There is a recommendation in the guideline formally to check in at the one month mark, but I would say that many practitioners who are very comfortable prescribing PrEP consider this to be optional uh, because we know that it's uh, so well tolerated most of the time. But certainly we want to emphasize that every interaction with a PrEP uh, using individual is an opportunity to talk to them about adherence, to talk to them about other risk reduction strategies, including vaccination and other prevention strategies for other STIs, uh, as uh, alluded to here. Uh, a couple other comments uh, that I'll highlight. We don't recommend routine bone densitometry screening unless it's otherwise indicated by osteoporosis guidelines. And just a reminder that TDF-FTC and TAF-FTC are both drugs that are active against hepatitis B infection. So if someone has hepatitis B infection, then remember that prescribing them PrEP is actually the same as prescribing the hepatitis B treatment. So you need to be comfortable uh, monitoring that as well. I'm going to end with just a couple of call to action type comments before um, taking folks' um, questions and, and, and comments. I'll try to make this very brief. In some of our PrEP implementation work that we've been doing, we've been asking folks for some of the reasons that they decline PrEP when it's recommended to them. And I wanted to just highlight for you not only that side effects, as I mentioned, are sometimes a concern as well as cost, but that the most common reason is that folks don't believe that they're at risk. So just a shout out to all of those of you who do the good work of really spending the time with individuals, helping to dissect their understanding of HIV risk, understanding that it's fluid, that it changes over time, and maybe context specific, um, uh, because this is really a major barrier to individual level interest in actually starting PrEP. The cost piece is huge. Um, it's great that we have many jurisdictions in the country where PrEP is truly free, um, but um, some of our uh, qualitative sociology and public health uh, colleagues have authored this paper recently, uh, arguing that really there is a, a strong argument for making this the case countrywide. In fact, uh, this is rolled into the move towards universal pharmacare, of course, as well, recognizing that the cost of an HIV infection, even in sheer economic terms, uh, over a lifetime, uh, vastly outweighs the, the, the cost of uh, PrEP. Uh, I wanted to put this up because I wanted to emphasize that in many countries around the world, many jurisdictions around the world, the left is a uh, uh, poster from um, uh, Australia, the right is a, um, a bus stop ad that I saw standing in San Francisco at the side of the street. Uh, in many other jurisdictions, there is much more active promotion of PrEP as a, a public health intervention. Uh, and that is really absent, I would argue, in much of this country. Um, and we need to be doing a better job of what many have called demand creation, destigmatizing this, actively promoting it as a health promotion intervention. Uh, right now, the ads that you do see for PrEP in many downtown cores uh, in Canada, at least that I have seen, uh, have come from individual clinics or individual pharmacies that are trying to drum up business. And kudos to them for doing that. But this is really a vacuum in terms of public health leadership in this country that I think we need to fill. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is that at the individual provider level, the way that we interact with patients is so important. I'm going to end the talk with this quotation from a participant in one of our qualitative studies some time ago who uh, said that there was a time in his life when he had been going through a bad part five years ago. Uh, in his words, I was just feeling lots of anxiety. I knew it was because I was gay. I tried to spin it off to something else. So I went to my doctor and I was like, I think I know why I'm so anxious all the time. And she's like, why? And I was like, I'm gay. And then she was like, I know lots of people that are becoming gay now. And I was like, oh, okay. It just reminded me a lot of doctors that are not really well versed with dealing with people who are gay and it didn't come from a bad place from her this is so important 
I just think it came from ignorance, and that's why I never felt comfortable talking to her about anything else. So how is that person ever going to get prep? How is that person ever going to get uh, proper STI screening, um, other sorts of services, if they don't even feel comfortable talking to their primary care provider about who they are? Uh, just a reminder about how important that connection with people is. So I've summarized the tools that we've got to end the epidemic of new HIV infections, which I think we have. We've got lots of safe and effective options, and I've highlighted some of them. And I hope I've inspired you just a little bit if you're not already engaged in this uh, crusade of, of uh, implementing PrEP more aggressively by addressing many of these issues. Um, here's um, our, our, our team website. I'll just point you to a, an online course that we've created for um, uh, prescribing PrEP if you're interested as well. So thanks so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tan. I've we have five questions from the audience. Is Discovery available to prescribe currently? Is the encounter based use of Truvada applicable to heterosexual men and women? Great question, so important. Unfortunately, uh, although Discovery CAF FTC is available to prescribe currently in Canada, it should not be prescribed to populations other than, um, uh, than uh, men, actually. So the trial data exists for gay, bi, and other men of sex with men, but it's also, you can extrapolate it actually probably to heterosexual men whose risk would be through the urethra, so anatomically we would think that the same data should apply. Unfortunately, we don't have any data to support its use in women, so it should not be prescribed to that population. Thank you. We have a question. Uh, do you know of any program in Canada currently offering PrEP specifically to PWID and heterosexual populations? Thank you so much for that question, Courtney. Such a great um, question, such great need. Unfortunately, the short answer is no, not programmatically. I think individual prescribers uh, are certainly uh, often comfortable doing this, but what we absolutely need, and certainly in the prairie provinces where you're located, we need more dedicated programs. We need folks to step out and, and try to roll this out more at a population level. Um, there globally has not been as much um, experience with using PrEP in PWID as there needs to be, even though there is one trial demonstrating its efficacy. Uh, I think it's a big implementation uh, uh, data gap uh, that I invite you to, 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 to lead, uh, perhaps, um, and, and others. Uh, someone had a comment about uh, the uh, knowledge of uh, PrEP uh, in clinician and in the population. Are there campaign that are going to happen or educational activity uh, to let them know about PrEP? Oui, merci beaucoup pour la question. Um, I think it's a great one. And I think the short answer is that, unfortunately, um, as I was trying to allude to, I don't think we do a good enough job of promoting the existence of PrEP. It, it exists, it's safe, and it's effective. Other jurisdictions have done a, a good job of, of doing that. I call it demand creation. Um, uh, but uh, you could also just call it, you know, awareness raising as a starting point. Um, many, uh, there's a lot of inequities when you look at data about awareness of, of PrEP, um, that racialized populations often have much lower knowledge of PrEP than, uh, than white, for example, folks and better uh, folks of a higher socioeconomic status. We need to do a better job of this, uh, and it needs to come from, from leadership. I think public health, certainly community agencies are trying to do their job. Um, individual clinicians and pharmacies are trying to do their job, but I think we need leadership in this regard. There's a question about, uh, uh, should I be reserving Truvada for, for patients who want to uh, use encounter-based PrEP and use Discovery for those who prefer to take it daily? It's a great question, Victoria. Thank you for that. I think it really is uh, uh, an area for shared decision-making, right, with so many other areas in medicine. I had a, a brief slide there where I tried to highlight some of the pros and cons of the two different options. Certainly, you might think one might think that there are clear long-term toxicity-related advantages to using TAF FTC or Discovy in terms of renal and bone toxicities being less. But as I highlighted, there are advantages to the TDF FTC as well, the 211 opportunity, the cost, of course, the weight, the lipid differences. So I really think it's a it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's a situation where you have to put these options available. Uh, to someone, talk about, talk them through, and see what's important to them. Thank you. Uh, if you have a patient that is on demand prep, uh, for ex and they have, for example, two three nights uh, high risk encounter in a row, would you suggest switch to daily? 
It's a great question. And again, this is something to individualize. The, um, uh, the recommendation that I, I glossed over is that if someone uses the 211, but then on that last day where they take that last pill, they have sex again, for example, the recommendation is to simply continue taking the daily prep until two days have elapsed since the last exposure. So in other words, 211, then you have sex, then take 11 again. Uh, so it may start to feel like they're taking it daily, especially if they have such frequent exposures that they're really effectively just, just taking it daily according to the 211 recommendation. So in that case, certainly it might, might make sense to switch. But again, it's context specific. Sometimes that happens because someone goes away on vacation uh, or something or sees someone that they have sex with and then they move away or something. So uh, again, it's individualizing the approach, but understanding how the 211 can be flexed to accommodate more frequent exposure. Uh, what are your thoughts on PrEP with uh, IV drug users? Yeah, it's a great question. And it was alluded to in the earlier question. I, I think we need to be bold and, and use it more, is my short answer. There, uh, we can have a very long conversation about the clinical trial data that support its use. But notably, I will share that that trial that demonstrates, the one clinical trial that demonstrates that this works in that context uh, was done in a setting where needle exchange programs were, were forbidden by law. It was done in Thailand. And so that bare basic uh, 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 level of service provision that we promote in Canada, we need to do a better job of promoting in Canada, what was not available. So what that means in terms of the incremental value of, of PrEP in our populations, I think needs to be explored through implementation work. But I think the clinical indication is there. Uh, we, we know we have explosive uh, epidemics in that population in many parts of this country. Uh, so I think I, I issued, the, you know, maybe it's a call to action. It's a challenge for, for those of us who work with that population to, to just do it. And last question from me. Uh, you didn't talk about uh, doxy use also for prophylaxis of uh, syphilis. Uh, maybe two line uh, of uh, an answer. Yeah, really exciting data showing that doxy as post-exposure prophylaxis works. Uh, 200 milligrams, two pills within 72 hours of a given sex act studied in GBM. Really exciting data out there. Uh, we have some, um, what I will share with this Canadian audience, we have a clinical trial that will soon be looking at doxy-pep versus doxy-prep here in Canada. It's called DISCO. It'll be starting later on this year at, with sites across Canada. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the field, please reach out. Uh, if you have patients who might be interested in this intervention, sure, you can prescribe it off-label if you would like but uh, maybe invite them also to, to, to participate in this, this opportunity to generate data comparing those two strategies head to head. We just don't know the answer yet and uh, we really need to find out. Great. I would like to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tan, for this uh, very good uh, overview of uh, PrEP uh, in uh, Canada. And for those uh, who are interested, uh, there will be posting of this uh, presentation on IUSTI Canada website in a few days. Uh, so for those who would like to share or want to uh, uh, see again the webinar, please be uh, feel free to go on, on the website. I would like uh, also to take time to uh, tell you about the next uh, IUSCI Canada webinar. It will be on the 17th of May, and it will be uh, with Dr. Robert Burke, from uh, New York. Uh, Robert uh, has uh, uh, agreed to do uh, a discussion about uh, microbiome uh, and the interaction uh, with uh, the acquisition of uh, HPV uh, and cervical cancer, as well as chlamydia. So we picked those two uh, examples where we have a lot of data. So uh, uh, we'll send you information about uh, this coming webinar about uh, microbiome uh, of the uh, cervical and vaginal tract uh, uh, with uh, uh, HIV, uh, uh, HPV and uh, chlamydia uh, acquisition. So that is all for today. I would like to finish by thanking uh, Greg Penny from uh, CPHA for the support and uh, the logistic. And uh, I hope you like this webinar and uh, hope to uh, see you on the 17th of May. And feel free to share with your colleagues and friends. Thank you all. Bye for now.